Okay, so uh, so we are still in the chapter about uh, um, braided monoidal category. So last uh, session we review about uh, the Dreenfeld morphism, so uh, naturalized morphism between uh, the identity and the double dual, involving the the braiding, and we prove. Uh, in fact, we mentioned this uh, this result. And you can see here that uh, uh, this uh, Dreenfeld morphism has a tensor structure, if and if the, 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 the tensor category is symmetric, which means that this is identity. So we prove that that was proved using these pictures natural, natural adjunction isomorphism, uh, Young Baxter relation, etc. Hexagon. Exa and uh, okay, so so now we will uh, mention an extra structure and uh, a braided monoidal category admit a ribbon structure if and if it admit a spherical structure. So we should see that. So. Um, so first, you consider a, a braided monoidal category, and the twist in a braided monoidal category is so a natural isomorphism between the identity functor and itself, such that um, so it has this. Uh, uh, it is it don't have a tense, It is not a tensor structure, but almost. Almost tensor structure up to uh, this uh, this factor, which is which really look like what we get from um, the Dreenfeld morphism. So they will have a strong relation between a twist and Dreenfeld morphism. A twist is an element. So here, be careful here, it's an automorphism. It's a natural isomorphism between the identity uh, function itself, with, whereas for the Dreenfeld morphism, it's a, a, a natural isomorphism between identity and the double dual, natural transformation. Um, so, okay. Uh, okay, so it is called the twist is called a ribbon structure. If for any x, the dual of this morphism is this morphism for x star. <clears throat> okay, so uh, which means that the, the, <clears throat> the twist is a uh, deal with the, the star structure, properly with the star structure. Okay, so. A ribbon category is a braided rigid, so we need rigid for star structure, monoid category with a ribbon structure, with a twist which is ribbon. Okay. So as I said, you will see that a braided fusion category is ribbon. So here we assume fusion is ribbon if and only if it is spherical. So, in some sense, this notion of ribbon is, at least in the fusion category framework, is already covered by the notion of spherical. So it's not so new in that sense. Okay. So. So this exercise is about so um, you consider the okay you consider the finite group the, the the center of representation of a finite group so in other words the representation on the Dreenfeld double and the exercise is to show that the Dreenfeld morphism as if, as as mentioned before is already a Riemann structure on that so as I said. 
high bound structure and uh, drain cell morphism. Drain cell morphism and twist really look like. And so, uh, okay. <clears throat> I don't remember if, um, I don't think, uh, as long as uh, x double star equal x, um, the drain cell morphism is always a twist and to be a ribbon structure, we need that. And I don't remember if this is always true for the infant morphism. Maybe not. At least we did not mention that up to now. But anyway. Okay, so at least for this group case, the infant double. The drain cell morphism is a, a ribbon twist. <clears throat> okay. So here we want to explain the, to justify the word ribbon. The ribbon refer to um, to something uh, to something. Uh, so it's an object, the usual object in the, the word, a uh, ribbon. So what's the link with, between ribbon and ribbon category? So we will see. Uh, we will do a, a kind of the same idea that we did for braided. We, we provided a model involving braided group. And for ribbon category, we provide a model involving a ribbon. Uh, so consider the braided model category of tangle as we recalled before. Um, so this category generalizes into what is called frame tangle category, where the string and the uh, closed or open string are replaced by oriented ribbon. So yeah, you replace that by such a ribbon, but you also put the orientation as same thing for the closed string. Uh, so here I ask whether it's really necessary to orient the closed string, but not, not sure. Uh, so this oriented ribbon, so glued together like that, you should have the same orientation. If you don't have the same orientation, you cannot look like that. Then here you can modelize the twist. Here is that the twist um, is given by the double twist of the ribbon. So you have a ribbon. So you can think as a piece of paper, a long piece of paper, and you can twist it. You can twist it one time, a second time. And so in this category, the twist will be the double twist, the double physical twist of the piece of paper, if you, want, if you like, <clears throat> like that. <clears throat> and this provides, uh, in fact, uh, a ribbon, so this twist is a ribbon structure on this category of frame tangle. Um, so remember that it's such a category, the tangle or the frame tangle are the morphism, not the, not the object. The objects are natural numbers. Um, <clears throat> so why it's a twist and why it is Ribbon. So twist. So you should see the twist structure. So we want to prove that equal that. In fact, you just uh, that can be proved pictorially like that. In fact, in fact, the definition is pictorial. So you have no choice. You have to provide a pictorial proof, or you can prove that uh, you just cut a piece of paper and you you, you do like that. You realize. That, uh, that can be moved in this way. So you, you just have the two, the, 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 you, 
can move inside the, this, uh, you can move this double twist, you can move it here, and this one, you can move it here. And what you get is only the usual braiding and the, the twist. So it, so it's really a twist. Um, and so why it is, why it is a, a rival structure? So I leave it. I left it as an exercise. So we have to prove uh, an exercise, or in fact, I, I, I provided a reference, but when I wrote this slide, uh, it was not clear to me how to prove that uh, directly picturally. So you have to prove that if you apply the dual of that, like that, so you have that, you apply the dual, you should get that. Um, so it was not clear to me pictorially, but if you are interested, you should check the paper on Rishetikin to IF. Anyway, so if the, the FT frame tangle can be seen as a universal ribbon category, as we did before, you, you can always provide a functor. So if you have a ribbon tensor category, so that, <clears throat> There is a unique natural functor from the category of frame tangle to C, sending. Um, so you, you have to fix, you fix one object also. Okay. So sending uh, the generating object. So um, here you have the object are integer and the generating object is one. Because the you remember the, the, the tensor structure here is just the addition two x. So you you have the generating object here and you, you send it you send one to x and it's a map from that so that it's not a priori surjective of course. <coughs> and this map uh, uh, p, uh, preserves the Ribbon structure. So. What about that? Um, okay, so here I'm talking about uh, and so the morphism between one and one two is isotopic class of frame link. Um, okay, so what about that? Um, so yeah, it's an example of framed link. Um, so I'm a bit confused here because one usually has one, one point. Um, anyway, what's the point here? <clears throat> Um, maybe it's zero. Maybe you should put zero here. Uh, it will make more sense to me. Uh, sorry, let me put. Um, um, Uh, oh, okay, I don't know. So maybe um, if you put just one, from one to one, there is no choice. And then you, you can, you can put uh, uh, some um, frame link like that. Because you have the, the identity between one and one. I don't know. Anyway, let me put. Uh, uh, yeah. One or zero. Let me think. I guess. 
I guess um, this is only the not uh, the positive integer. There is no, there is no uh, zero. Anyway. <clears throat> um, so it's a tensor. It's a tensor category. So from one to one, you have yeah identity. Um, so okay, we have identity, and you can have some frame link in addition. Let's see. Okay, so um, um, wait. Okay, so you have to consider that this previous um, <coughs> functor. Uh, so this previous functor provides an invariant of frame link with a value in, okay. So this, in the tensor structure, the, it's a it's scalar. Um, so I'm a bit confused, I'm sorry about that. Um, usually, <clears throat> Uh, yeah, ah, yeah, okay, nice, maybe. Because I remember that, <clears throat> um, if I'm not mistaken, the unit object is not depicted. So you can have, a, you can see a closed string as a morphism from one to one, because it's, the one is not depicted in that sense. So I guess it is fine, so it's okay. I don't want to, to, to spend much more time. It should be something like that. So <clears throat> this is a scalar. So that provides under this, uh, under this functor. So you, you, you fix, so you, you map this here. And so this is a scalar here. And so you get a, a you get a, a number which is called uh, the ratio ticking to IF invariant of the, of the frame or the link, in fact. Okay. Okay. So it's okay. So this is only to provide some motivation for motivation. So this is the, a bit of a topological quantum field theory. So if now you consider uh, the category of representation of this uh, quantum group, UKSL2, um, and you take X to be the, the standard two-dimensional representation. So here I forget to mention that the, this invariant depends on the category and also the choice of the, the choice of the object X. Anyway, so here you choose X to be the usual two-dimensional representation. Uh, then here it's mentioned that this invariant, in this case, is essentially the Jones polynomial. Jones polynomial of a knot. Uh, not Jones introduced this uh, Jones polynomial to provide some uh, new invariant of knot to which were able to distinguish new, not that is uh, the previous invariant was, was not able to, and he got the field middle for that. And um, his ID come from subfactor theory. <coughs> okay. Temporary lib, uh, etc. Okay. Um, mm, Okay, so I, I don't want to read this. Um, okay, so what about now? Um, so if you take a brief tensor category of field K, um, oh, so this is about a mistake in the book. 
So the book state, um, state this, zero is, so this is not zero, but, uh, what? <clears throat> so wait, wait. Eight, ten, five. Eight, ten, five. So Pavel Tinkoff wrote uh, Eratum of this book, and he stated that so eight, ten, five is non zero. For any non zero simple object X, for any non zero simple object X, this is non zero. Uh, okay. Um, so I don't I don't remember whether it is true in characteristic zero or false in characteristic zero. At least if k is a characteristic positive. Uh, I see. So okay, I mean it's false in positive characteristic, and I expect it to be true in positive in characteristic zero. But it should be checked. Okay. I see. So here, uh, but we need to generalize a bit the young baxter relation. We, um, the young baxter relation is uh, this equal this when f is uh, trivial. Or when f, no, when f is, um, when f is, uh, one um, when f is yeah this this uh, this braiding, but in fact using the hexagon relation, you can uh, generalize the young baxter relation. This equal this. You use the, the hexagon relation, then you you move the string, you move the twin closer like that, and then you use naturality to put this here, and then you apply hexagon again. So, so when f is a usual braiding, you have the usual young baxter relation. But you can put anything else for f. For example, you can put the reverse braiding. Uh, okay. Yeah. So this. Okay. Wait. So this. So I don't remember which one is the reverse braiding. Or not, but the young Baxter relation is for one braiding, and you can have a, a, another relation for the other braiding. Um, uh, anyway, so if you have the other braiding, you can put the other braiding until you get this. Uh, uh, young Baxter relation, like uh, what, what, which will be used. Which can be used in the some proof. Okay, and will be used. So, um, you take a braided tensor category, and uh, we want to prove here that the Drinfeld morphism is a natural exomorphism. So, yeah. So, what I said before, I stated. I define the Dirichfeld morphism as a natural transformation. So now we need to prove that it's more than the natural transformation, it's a natural isomorphism. And to show that it's a natural isomorphism, we will provide. Uh, so this was already done, so I will skip the proof, but. Just to show you the idea, we just provide a, a candidate for the inverse. So you have a, u is a natural transformation, and we, we provide a candidate inverse v for another natural transformation, and uh, given by a collection of vx, and we want to prove the composition our identity. The composition here is just putting together like that the two. Uh, uh, Picture, and we want to show that this equal to this. 
So the, we, we did that uh, last semester also by picture. So, um, um, that reduce to this, this to this to, to this lemma, and then you have zigzag. So we just have to prove this lemma, and we also also prove that. And so you you used we we, we did that at the end of last uh, last semester. You use naturality. You move you move that here, etc. Again, naturality. Now we use hexagon relation. Here we use extended young baxter again hexagon and naturality uh, what about that the trivial composition the exact relation and you get that so we prove that the uh, Greenfeld morphism is a natural isomorphism okay now if you consider a braiding tensor category, and you take any other natural isomorphism. So you take any other natural isomorphism. If you compose this natural isomorphism with the inverse of the braiding morphism, you get a natural isomorphism from identity to itself. And so you get a candidate for a twist. So you get a twist and you get a candidate for a, a, a ribbon structure. Uh, so if this natural isomorphism is a, is, a, is a tensor isomorphism, so if, in, a, in other words, if it is a pivotal structure, so this is a pivotal structure, if and only if, um, this is a twist on, on uh, the reversed, uh, the reversed uh, category. So here, I guess I fix something in the book, which is not exactly what is written in the book, but up to some sign or some reverse, I don't remember. Okay. So, uh, you take any other natural isomorphism, you compose with the inverse of the Blutzfeld double, you get a twist, and this twist is, no, this, no you get something, and this something is a twist, uh, at least in the, this inverse, if and if, this is a pivotal structure. Okay. So, um, so let me see. So you have that, you can write like that. So, okay, so I already did this proof last semester, so I will skip it also. But, okay. Mm -hmm. So you start from the fact that it is, uh, 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 it has a tensor structure, so it's a pivotal. And you, it don't look so complicated. You finish by the fact that this is a twist. Um, at least, yeah, this appears from the Drinfeld for season. But you know. um, okay. You know that. So it's okay. Now, if this is a twist, so you can write it like that, blah, blah, blah. So you get it like, so it's, it's almost. Uh, Immediate. Okay, so uh, so this is the link we expected between Drinfeld morphism and and um, and twist. So you can go from one to the other using a natural uh, a pivotal structure, natural isomorphism, which is a tensor structure. Okay, so now we will again consider uh, something I am not very comfortable with. So some consideration about the non semisimple case. So again, um, uh, so I may be quickly also for this part because <clears throat> 
So uh, let S be the sock of the projective cover of one. So remember that the projective cover of one, um, so projective cover of X, you have an epimorphism. Um, so this is a universal way to do, to do that with this uh, projective. So of one, and then the sock is a maximal semi-simple sub-object. Maximal semi-simple sub-object. Okay. And the dual distinguish invertible object is a double dual of that. Okay. So recall, there is a natural isomorphism between the double dual uh, functor and you, the double left dual and the double right dual, but uh, um, with this D and D inverse on the left and on the right, like that. Okay, so, so remember you have this D, like that, and this natural isomorphism. And so you consider a braided phi tensor category with braiding C. You consider D and delta X as A above. You consider the, um, the braid, the Drinfeld, Drinfeld natural isomorphism. And then you can prove that um, you have this complicated formula involving the evaluation map. So identity, identity, braiding, this delta, and <coughs> the Drinfeld morphism. So I, I did not draw some picture here. It, I should maybe. Um, yeah, maybe there is a picture to do here to understand more to better understand this picture. There should be a, a picture for that. Anyway. Um, corollary. So if you take a braided tensor category as before, and you take the uh, D, the object D as before, and for all objects in the category, you have, so here D is fixed as I above and V is uh, random. Um, if you make this composition, you get this identity. So it's not symmetric in general, but it's locally symmetric in the sense it's, you can see it as symmetric relatively to this D. So this D, is a specific in that sense. So distinguish invertible object. Okay. Um, okay. So the double braiding involving this D is always identical. Uh, okay. And the proof of that will use this formula. Uh, okay, okay. Well, I don't want to go to the details of that. Okay, now <clears throat> recall that. Uh, what about that? You can, so C is a braided category. So you can embed it in, into its center using the, the braiding like that. Every braided tensor category embed in the, the center. Or you can also embed the reverse braiding like that, involving the, re the, the reverse braiding. Like that, okay. So you have this, you have these two uh, uh, embedding functor. Uh, you can combine them together using the uh, Dulling tensor product. You get uh, a map like that. We already that mentioned that, and uh, uh, the category, the bridge category, would be called. It's called factorizable if this is an equivalence of. Okay. okay. And this proposition states that if C 
is, so is factorizable. Uh, so I guess uh, this definition of factorizable, you require C to be braided. So I guess factor. I, for braided category. So if a braided category C is factorizable, finite tensor category, then it is unimodular. So then the D, the distinguished invertible object this recall before is trivial, is one. This is the definition of unimodular. Uh, okay, so we already know that. Okay, so um, so as I can see, the, the proof is not so, it's almost immediate from the factorizable assumption using, using this property of D. Hmm. Um, the intersection of the image of C, the image, ah, okay. There's a kind of intersection. Hmm. Anyway. Uh, so in the unimodular case, uh, so when you are in this case, of course, this, this complicated map defined before is very, Easy now you have this uh, natural isomorphism between the double double left dual and the double right dual, <clears throat> and the previous equation, complicated equation before, um, reduced to that. Okay. So uh, okay. So we get this formula. Um, so if you apply. You replace x by a triple left dual. You can write it like that, and its inverse can be written like that, and this can be proved using this this property we mentioned uh, in the beginning of the course. Mm. And this will be used in. So it's a bit technical. I'm not very happy with this. Uh, I'm not sure if I should state that in the review part because it's too complicated. Anyway, so let C be a braided fusion category with a twist. Okay, so we don't know whether it is ribbon. In fact, uh, um, this proposition states that this twist is ribbon if and only if uh, this is spherical. So, what is the canonical pivotal structure? Ah, okay. Um, uh, ah, this is you. Okay. Uh, it was confusing to, to you. So if you have the canonical pivotal structure involving the twist and the Drinfeld morphism, so this, so there is maybe a problem in which order you should write that. It should be like that or like that. Because we, in the previous proposition, we, we, we prove for, for the inverse, but it's anyway, up to some uh, fixing this, uh, these details. Um, twist and Drinfeld morphism is a pivotal structure which is spherical if and only if the twist is a ribbon structure. So ribbon structure, remember that this is this proposition. Okay, so this proposition uh, exactly states that the notion of ribbon category is completely covered by the notion of spherical. So so in some sense, ribbon is not so new. It's not essentially new. Okay, so um, 
So we did that also last semester. So it's an if and only if proof. So you have to, to prove two ways. So, um, so what is the first way here? <clears throat> so I guess we start from ribbon structure. Okay. No, no, no. I see. So, ah, yeah, we, we are doing if and if from the beginning. So, ribbon if and if we have that. Uh, so, if and if we have that. Okay. And um, I guess we will use the formula, this formula. So this is equal to that by this formula. Okay. And this was, in fact, it was the point where we finished last semester. In fact, last semester, we did not finish this proof. So I just uh, complete it here, completed it here. Uh, so this is uh, completely, this is new. So I put it in this, uh, in this slide. So you see then there is nothing because after the pause, we will start the new material. In fact, the new material starts from here, but this is just the end of the proof. And after the pause, we will start a new subsection which was not covered before about ribbon of algebra. So let me finish this proof. So we have ribbon, which is equivalent to that equal that. But when X is a simple object, um, uh, in fact, the, the morphism, this uh, home space is one dimensional. So a morphism here is completely determined by its trace. So this equality is equivalent to this equality involving the trace. Okay. Um, so here it's a result uh, covered uh, uh, on chapter seven. So if you have a, an object, you have a, a morphism from um, this object and it's double right dual, then uh, the trace of the dual of this morphism is equal to the trace of this morphism composed with delta V inverse. And delta V inverse is, I guess, this, this one. And um, moreover, um, we have the pivotal structure. On the pivotal structure, we have this equality. So we prove also that. So you have this equality, we prove that also before. So if you apply this and this to this, you get, um, so this, so I, I just recalled. Um, so you have that, this is equal to that, okay, uh, using um, that. And then you apply uh, this here. You get that directly. And again, you apply that and you get that, I guess. You apply that, you get that. What? Uh, um, ah, maybe there are four. Four dual. Here, you get that. No, I guess here you get that. And the trace. I guess here the trace is invariant by double dual. So, I guess. Okay, so let me do the pause here. So we can restart. Okay. Um, yeah, so here the, the trace is really invariant by, by double dual, but in fact, it should also be invariant by dual itself if you have a if a morphism, the trace is something like that. If you take the dual of a morphism, 
So trace will be something like that, which is basically the same. <coughs> Using a uh, uh, zigzagulation or something. Yeah. So this is okay. <coughs> so what we did, we started from this ribbon, which is equivalent to this equal this. So trace, by the, the equalities, we can do the equality at the level of trace. So ribbon is equivalent to that. <clears throat> but if you take y equal x star, then this is nothing but the dimension, and we take sample dimension of, uh, of y equal dimension of y star, which is the definition of spherical. So ribbon equivalent to spherical. So what did we use as a ribbon, ribbon? Yeah, we started from ribbon. So we took, uh, we started from that. So this is ribbon. So we, we formulate that at this level and you get this. And so then you have, from that, we do blah, 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 blah. We apply the trace. We apply the, we apply this, uh, this uh, map and you get, finally you get that. So, which is equivalent to spherical. Okay. And finally, um, so if you have a ribbon tensor category with a twist, uh, theta, then the dimension of any of an object X can be written pictorially like that. So involving the twist and the braiding. And uh, so this, I skip it, it's in this book here. And this exercise is stating that the, the trace of this braiding is the dimension uh, divided by the twist on, on x. So x is a simple object, I guess. If you assume x to be a simple object, um, an isomorphism, it's here, it's a, it's a scalar. <clears throat> okay, so, so that's all for this section and now let me go to new material so now i will write everything with my hand so now it's completely new so it will be slower And we will try to make some proof, not all the proof, but some proof. I think it's interesting. Uh, okay. Okay, so. So this is a new material part. Um, so the three, so as, we, as you know, the three previous semester were reviewed. Uh, in the 12th first session. Here we are still in the 12th, the, the 12th session. So this 12 session is divided into a review and new new material. Okay. So now new a new section. So the first, the next section will be quite quick. So the section which will be on which we will we will 
the section which will require more time, which will be the, the section after this one. So this one is ribbon algebra of algebra. algebra. And the next section will be characterization of Morita equivalence involving the, the Drinfeld center. So first, um, uh, ribbon of algebra. So the idea of ribbon of algebra is to reformulate the ribbon structure at the level of, of algebra. Okay. So recall that uh, of algebra is quasi triangular if and if the representation is braided. Of algebra H is quasi triangular. In fact, you can use this characterization as a definition if you like, but you have, also, as, we, as we mentioned before, there is a complete characterization as a level of, um, of algebra. So if the representation category is braided, that we know. So now what about a ribbon? So the notion of a ribbon of algebra correspond to <clears throat> the additional assumption to its category of representation. Ribbon algebra correspond to the additional assumption that the category of representation of H is ribbon with a twist. Okay. Let me remove that. Don't like it. Okay. So now, <clears throat> remember. So let the universal air matrix coming from um, is a universal air matrix coming from the braiding. Universal air matrix coming from the braiding. Uh, okay, then. What about the twist? So if you have a ribbon, if um, if this so this is a braided category, um, we, we raise an additional ribbon structure. This twist. So what about the consequence of the existence of this twist of this uh, ribbon structure to the off algebra? So the twist. Sorry. The twist theta define a central a central element V in uh, in uh, H. So how? Uh, Uh, so how I will write it in green because it's not specified in the book. So how do you define an element of H from the twist? So recall. So you have the uh, forgetful functor. Uh, so let me remove it. From rep H to back. Forgetful functor. Okay. And remember that H is the algebra of, um, of natural transformation between F and itself. So natural. Tr 
transformation. We give an S uh, between F and F, between F and itself. Uh, okay, now um, uh, the twist is an element. So it's a natural isomorphism between the identity and itself, natural isomorphism. Um, okay, so V in H realized as that is defined is defined by a collection uh, uh, of um, morphism by the collection uh, v x um, f x map to f x and the map here is um, f theta x. Okay, so um, um, okay. So this is a way to define like that. You define an element here from the twist. You need to define it as the natural transformation. Okay. Now, so of course, you need to check it's really a natural transformation. So, so, so it is a way to go from ribbon category to. In fact, so the axiom of ribbon reformulate at, uh, at the off algebra level as follow. So definition, and of course, after this definition, they will have a result stating that this definition is really what you expect to be. So a ribbon A ribbon of algebra is a triple, so it should be quasi triangular. So it's a triple HRV. Um, where so HR is quasi triangular, quasi triangular, um, and V is an invertible central. In fact, we did not talk about uh, central here. We did not mention it should be central also. Invertible central, central. Uh, element such that, so the co-multiplication of V is V tensor V. Uh, R one R inverse and V equal the antipode so it's invariant by antipode. Okay, so in fact, I don't want to go into the details of that. I just wanted to state that the notion of ribbon can be formulated at the level of of algebra for 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 the category. Uh, coming from our algebra, of course, not all the tensor category, not all the braided category uh, coming from our algebra, 
but for the one coming from upper algebra, that is a way to reformulate the Ribbon structure. And of course, as you can expect, uh, there's a correspondence between Ribbon structure in upper algebra and Ribbon structure in the category, more precisely. Under previous uh, notation, there is a one to one correspondence, correspondence between isomorphism classes of. So it's always up to isomorphism, of course. Uh, Ribbon structure. V on HR and Ribbon structure. Theta on R representation of H where the braiding is given with braiding given by the, this universal R matrix. Um, where the braiding is given by R. So maybe we can write. Uh, can write like that CR if you like, but it does not matter. The braiding corresponding to R. Okay, so here is a, uh, <clears throat> you can see it as a, a reconstruction theorem if you like <clears throat> at the level of Ribbon. Ribbon, Brady, tensor category. Um, okay. Uh, so I skip the proof of that. Um, oh, sorry. Because um, I'm not, uh, I don't want to focus to focus so much. In fact, I, I, I skip most of the proof involving of algebra. I don't want to focus too much about of algebra in this course. Okay, so what about example of Ribbon of algebra? So any, any triangular of algebra is as a ribbon structure, as a ribbon structure, V equal one. And maybe I hope I did not make a mistake in some previous course, but triangular is not, did not correspond to modular, but correspond to symmetric. So quasi triangular correspond to braided, and maybe in, a, in some previous course I said, uh, Triangular correspond to modular, no. Triangular correspond to symmetric. So the complete orthogonal notion. So triangular is, can be characterized by the fact that the representation is symmetric. So the application of the braiding and again the braiding is the identity. <clears throat> But um, Okay. You can define, I guess, factorizable of algebra, and this, which, which should more look like to modular of algebra. Hmm. That's more look like to modular, but I guess it's not, uh, not every uh, modular are factorizable, or not every factorizable are modular, but anyway. In fact, there is no specific notion from of algebra which Representation category is modular, but that's, that may be called modular of algebra. But anyway, we did not yet 
talk about modular fusion category, but this will come, in fact, in the com in the next um, session. And the notion of modular tensor category is, in my opinion, one of the most important notion. Okay, so quantum double. So triangular is, is right. Quantum double. Uh, is also right bone for G a finite group. Um, the field of any characteristic, any characteristic, sorry, let me write it. Um, K of any characteristic. Um, so is right bone also with the equal the Drinfeld morphism. Uh, Drinfeld morphism. So again, you should be careful here. It is written like that in the book, but I guess. It's an abuse of notation uh, in the sense that uh, um, you should define V, in fact, using the Drinfeld morphism as before, if I'm not mistaken. So be careful here. X double star equal X. Uh, yeah. So you is um, um, so wait, let me write it like that. Wait, wait. U is um, so is a natural isomorphism. It's a natural isomorphism. Like that, but um, this is equal to this here, I guess. Huh? So U is in and I D C, and so define define V as. Uh, collection to define V as we did before. I guess it is a way you should do that. Uh, otherwise, it makes no sense to say V equal U. But I hope I, I'm not doing something more complicated than it should be. But at least you can do that. Like that. Mm -hmm. F of UX. Uh, as we did for uh, to twist and uh, and uh, so I hope I'm not mistaken here. Okay, this this is supposed to be an element. This is supposed to be an element. Oh, oh, you. Say so. Okay. So this is supposed to be an element in and of f, but u is supposed to be an element of and of um, identity. And f um, here is uh, is not the identity. So what about that? Is f can be can you see f as the identity? Uh, no, no. Anyway, that should be correct. Okay. So now, the last example. So any any semi simple and co semi simple quasi triangular. 
Hop, algebra. Euh, is a ribbon with v equal u. So I, as before, I guess. Uh, and um, um, such up algebra has S square equal identity. So it's okay for this construction because unless I am mistaking, we needed this which can be correspond to that. Um, okay. Um, um, uh, uh, uh. So I'm thinking whether we can think, whether we can think the, the forgetful functor as the identity. Um, uh, no. And so now we can start an interesting section in which we will try to make some proof. So characterization of Morita equivalence. Characterization of Morita equivalence. Okay. We will start this section now and we will finish it next week. So recall. So let me recall briefly what we know about Morita equivalence. So recall is in green like that. Recall that two tensor categories, C and D, are called categorically Morita equivalence, categorically Morita equivalence. So it, ma it makes sense to, to put this reminder here because this section is dedicated to Morita equivalence. So it is good to have really this notion in mind uh, Fresh, fresh. So <clears throat> it's categorically Morita equivalent if there exists an exact C module category, M, exact C module category, and a tensor equivalence. between the opposite of D and the dual of C with respect to M. We defined it and we mentioned it several times. Um, yeah. So I don't recall the definition of the dual of C with respect to M. Hmm. Um, Okay. Um, so maybe I want to write definition of that or not. Let me see if I can find it dual quickly or not. Dual with respect to okay. one hundred and fifty-five. So Mm -hmm. I see. So this is the, so it's equal to the category of functor, of C module functor between M and itself. <sighs> Ok, 
catégorie of C module factor. Maybe should we assume exact or not? Anyway. OK. Uh, now, now what about um, Friedfeld Center? So recall again. Recall. If C is finite and M in decomposable. Then the center of the dual of C with respect to M is braided equivalent to the center of C reverse. Braided equivalence. Um, okay, so it's a bit confused here. Let me write it. Um, hmm, wait. Oh, sorry. Okay. <clears throat> so these two recall. And the point of this section is to prove the converse of this, uh, uh, of this, um, this uh, result. Hmm. So, um, so uh, for C D finite tensor category, if C and D are Morita equivalent. Then uh, their Dunfell center are braided, braided uh, equivalent. Braided equivalence. So this is very important. And the, the goal of this, the goal here is to prove the converse. The goal of this, of this section is to prove the converse so for two finite tensor categories. If their center is braided equivalent, then they are more equivalent. This section is to prove, the goal is to prove the converse. So, which means that the notion of more equivalence is completely characterized, so in other words, In other world, the notion of Morita equivalence is completely characterized, characterized using the center. That's why this section is called characterization of multi-points. Okay. Um, now. Okay. So now we will go into more details. So let's see. be a finite tensor category.
Um, so just let me remark here that <clears throat> um, it's a complete characterization. So in fact, you can alternatively define the notion of monetary equivalence just using the center. You, you, in fact, you can define monetary equivalence. You don't need to, to, to know the notion of a dual with respect to a module. It's, you can alternatively define monetary equivalence like that. <clears throat> OK, so uh, you take a finite answer category. Uh, let um, F C uh, the forgetful functor the forgetful functor and I C from C to uh, the center it's right adjoint of uh, the forgetful functor. <clears throat> okay. um, so the functor the functor the forgetful functor induce the structure of, of a Z, C module on, on C induce a structure of on C, okay, as, a, as usual. So first lemma, you will prove um so there is a natural isomorphism between natural isomorphism given by a coll this collection of isomorphism in fact it's a book as you can as you as uh, i already mentioned they write natural isomorphism directly at the level of the collection. So a natural isomorphism is a, is a natural transformation between two functors, but they, they write it directly at the level of the collection of, of uh, morphism, here collection of isomorphism. So there is a natural isomorphism um, uh, like that, given at the level of um, the collection internal home so let me write it um, with more space ah, so the right adjoint of the forgetful functor map x to an object which is isomorphic to the internal home on the center of one x um, uh, which means, as I said, natural isomorphism uh, between the functor I, uh, I see and like that. One is two functor. <clears throat> okay. So the proof. Uh, so maybe I will have time to write this proof. Proof. So the module tensor product. The module tensor product. of the center of C on its mod module. So via the forgetful functor, satisfy. Um, so, 
So here, so this is equal to like that. I want to say that's one equal. So here, this is an element of the center. This is an element of C. And this is a module tensor point. Okay. Uh, now, um, so this is in C. Both are in C. Okay. So this is written as. Uh, let me write this equality as star. Okay, so now, so ohm in the center between Z and I, like that. So it's a usual ohm space. So by definition of right adjoint, you have the natural isomorphism between that and that, so you move you replace, you move I on the left and you replace it by F. So here it's natural adjunction isomorphism. Natural adjunction isomorphism from definition of right adjoint. Okay. Then, it is <coughs> isomorphic to home C Z tensor one because by um, this is just a star. In fact, this is just this star here. <coughs> F this equal this. But you have to be careful that here it is a module tensor product. <coughs> module tensor product. Okay. And it is isomorphic to the uh, like that, by definition of internal home. Uh, uh, and here I forgot something. Internal home ZC one X. And here is definition definition of internal home. And so, let me just write the last line. So it, it is true for all Z in the center. So the result follow by Yoneda Lema. Okay. You have what you wanted. This is true for all um, for all Z here. And so you have this, which is uh, either you have the natural isomorphism between this and this, which is what we wanted to prove. And um, and uh, yeah, we can stop here. Yeah.